Dear colleagues, dear participants, dear friends of Reconnect, a warm, wel warm welcome to this Reconnect workshop on the rule of law conditionality regulation. My name is Jan Wouters. I'm the coordinator of the Reconnect project, and it is my pleasure to open this workshop today and thank the organizers of the Institute of Public Goods and Policies, the IPP, of the Spanish National Council of Research for making today's online panel happen. Of course, we would all have liked to be with you in Madrid, but that is our life right now. Reconnect, as many of you know, is a Horizon 2020 project that has been around for almost four years now. And we are heading towards the grand finale in April of this year, which is merely two months away. But for those of you who are not yet familiar with us, please allow me to say just a few words about Reconnect. As I said, it's an Horizon 2020 project, four years of research, multidisciplinary research on reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. So now you know what the acronym RECONNECT stands for. We created this project to understand, but also to provide solutions to recent challenges faced by the European Union. And two of those challenges are the rule of law crisis and democratic backsliding in our member states. Thus, RECONNECT set out to boost the EU's legitimacy through strengthening these foundational values, the democracy and the rule of law values of the European Union. We do so in two central parts, two central reports actually, that bring together all of our Reconnect research into um, final uh, deliverables, as we call this technically under the project. There will be one paper which will present what we call a new narrative of European integration, which will hopefully enable the EU to become more attuned to the expectations of its citizens. And the other final paper will propose changes to the EU's founding treaties in order to strengthen the EU's normative foundations. So please do mark your calendars because both reports will be officially launched at the final Reconnect conference, which will take place over three days from 19 to the 21st of April. The first two days, 19 and 20, will be online seminars. The last day, however, Thursday the 21st, we will hopefully all welcome you live physically at Brussels in the Fondation Universitaire. Now, before we come to the final conference of Reconnect, we are meeting today for what I would say the last public workshop, which we are organizing under Reconnect. This workshop takes place under the auspices of what we call Work Package 10 and the coordination of our excellent friend and colleague, Professor Carlos Closa, who has investigated democratic and rule of law principles and practices in the EU's macroeconomic and fiscal governance as one of the case studies under Reconnect. Entitled Enforcing the Rule of Law, the Rule of Law Conditionality Regulation, this workshop could actually not be more timely because as you all know, we have had two very important judgments of the European Court of Justice last week on the 16th of February regarding exactly Regulation 2020-2092. This regulation, also known as the rule of law conditionality mechanism, was adopted at the end of 2020. And as you probably know, the Council and the European Parliament adopted the European Commission's proposal aimed at linking the disbursement of EU funds conditional to the compliance with the rule of law in EU member states. Now, this regulation has not been without controversy, not least stemming from the continuous delay in the launch of the mechanism, especially due to some tactics from member states. One of the many attempts for delay were the annulment actions brought by the Hungarian and Polish governments against the regulation before the Court of Justice. They were dismissed last week by the court 
And the remarkable rulings of the court are really laying a renewed emphasis on the EU's fundamental values. To put it in the words of our great Reconnect colleague, Laurent Pesch, the EU is not a cash machine, eh? and EU law is not an a la carte menu. The Court of Justice has reiterated once again that Article 2 of the EU treaty, which lists those fundamental foundational values of the EU, contains, and I quote, contains values which are an integral part of the very identity of the European Union as a common legal order and are given ex concrete expression in principles containing legally binding obligations for the member states, end of quote. The court went on to say, and I quote again, that the rule of law is a value common to the EU and the member states, which forms part of the very foundations of the EU and its legal order, and which as a fundamental principle of EU law can be enforced by financial rules that is through the EU budget. These judgments mark really a turning point for the EU's rule of law enforcement. And they have finally removed the last obstacle for the application of the rule of law conditionality mechanism. I'm very much convinced that the panelists today will have much, much more to say on the essence and on the implications of the court's judgments, but also on the nature and the specific features of the regulation, its origins, the negotiation process, and what it all entails for its actual application and interpretation. The organizers have brought together really a stellar panel of both stakeholders and practitioners and academics who will also look into the future scope of the mechanism after the rulings of last week. I will leave it to Carlos to say more about the panels and to introduce our esteemed speakers. But let me highlight again that I'm really very proud that we can be at this workshop today. And I'm very much looking forward to today's interventions and interactions. Thank you very much. And I now hand the floor over to Carlos. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much for your introduction and for putting in context what we are doing with this uh, seminar. Uh, and I would like to start my, my intervention by saying that perhaps uh, the European Union is facing like uh, never before what I will call a compliance dilemma. Uh, and this dilemma can be constructed as, a, as it follows. Uh, with the European Union is a community of law and depends very much on observance of the law for mm -hmm. compliance, it lacks coercion mechanism as the last mechanism that we saw to effectively warranty compliance. And hence, depends entirely on national authorities' willingness to comply. That creates a problem. What happens when governments openly defy European Union law and European institutions' authority? In that situation, non-compliance is the new normal, and the need for turning to a form mechanism increases. But yeah, we are in a situation in which existing enforcement mechanisms, perhaps with the exception of uh, infringement procedures, which are a highly incidental mechanism, the rest of the enforcement mechanism have not worked at all, I would say. And I think most of my colleagues in, in Reconnect and elsewhere agree with this diagnosis. Article 7 has been totally diagnosed as a failure. The mechanism of dialogue uh, and naming and shaming of the council, but also the framework of the commission have not delivered anything, really. So we are in a situation in which enforcement mechanisms, with the exception of imprinting procedures, lack credibility. And it's, at the same time, the curious thing is that uh, those errant governments in certain countries are the biggest beneficiaries of European Union you know, funds. You know, it's something that uh, Dan Kellerman very aptly has qualified as uh, the kind of uh, paradox, uh, the authoritarian equilibrium. These uh, authoritarian regimes can be sustained because the European Union pays for some of the most popular policies. Now, the European Union conditionality regulation, so-called the conditionality regulation, emerged in the junction of uh, the need for huge financial capabilities from the European Union, a critical moment triggered by the pandemic, and at the same time, the failure, the recorded failure to enforce rule of law against certain errant governments, uh, which at the same time may become the largest beneficiaries of those funds, at least in relative terms. So it's a highly topical uh, 
uh, typical issue because it uh, meets in the, in the juncture between, on the one hand, macroeconomic and fiscal governance concerns, but at the same time, it has huge implications for the of law and for me. And naturally, the regulation was born in a context where there were several difficulties. Jan has already mentioned one of them. The Hararian and Polish governments veto initially the, the, the conditionality regulation. Um, the, the agreement came out of a, con a compromise within the European Council that delayed the application and uh, afterwards was challenged in front of the, of the court. So the, the whole bone of the, of the birth of the, of the regulation was highly problematic. And of course, many commentators, among them some of the recurrent uh, colleagues, have criticized it because being too weak and lacking systematic character by focusing on specific values and not the whole set of values of Article, Article 2, and some other arguments that can be really considered uh, valid. So we've been an interesting instrument at the same time, the, the regulation was all in a context in which criticism and negative dimensions did were um, highly upset. Nevertheless, it is true that there are some strong points in the regulation. First of all, that most member state governments have agreed uh, with, the, with the regulation, and that has to reinforce on how the constitutional action of the European Union by bringing together enforcement and values in a very solid, uh, a solid way. And I would say, against perhaps the most pessimistic views, that there has been already some action that proves that uh, there is some value in the, in the conditionality regulation. I mean, that the recovery plans for Hungary and Poland were delayed by the, um, by the Commission, and that put a, a lot of uh, pressure on those specific uh, norms. Now, as Jan has mentioned, the European judgment of the 16th February has been a turning point in, in the whole debate. I think the judgment was uh, really expected in, in what it delivered. Uh, just let me bring a, a couple of points here to underline the importance of the judgment. First, uh, the, the core itself highlighted the relevance of the judgment sitting as a full core and live streaming the decision. And this symbolic dimension, I think, shouldn't be done play. And there are some elements, or some legal elements that also are important. Um, the first is that uh, the court has confirmed the fact that uh, compliance with values is also required post-accession as a form of conditionality. And has established that uh, compliance with UK union values can be reduced an obligation which a candidate state must meet in order to access the UK union, and which might disagree after this accession. And I think this is a crucial, a crucial element. Second, the ruling, of course, removes uh, all the obstacles that were there for action by the European Commission, uh, that they are from the, from the limitations that the European Council introduced when the agreement on the ratio back in December 2020 uh, was made. And thirdly, and I think it's important, and perhaps has it been really underlined, the court has delivered an important word. Uh, the court has ruled that despite the reference to the European Council in the regulation, Article 7 of that regulation does not confer any role to the European Council in the procedure established by the regulation. That could be a kind of marginal element in the whole discussion about the regulation, but I think it's important to underline that the court has said explicitly the European Council does not play a role. It, it happened otherwise in the, in the past. Now, it is true that despite the, the regulation and something perhaps will be discussed uh, by some of our panelists, the reaction of the Commission to regulations has been a little bit mild. And uh, Van der Leyen reacted by saying that the European Commission would analyze carefully the reasoning of the judgment and their possible impact on the further steps that would take under the regulation. So no automatic immediate action was announced following the ruling. And that indicates perhaps that the Commission is still prepared to wait a little bit more before activating the range of tools that are available under the conditionality of the regulation. This is something open for debate and probably the current circumstances that may appear in the debate of the current uh, war crisis in Ukraine, uh, the conditions for this activation perhaps could be somehow analyzed. And I hope that some of our speakers may address uh, this question. Now, as I said, we have a stellar, stellar group of uh, participants to discuss, uh, to discuss uh, the topic here. And uh, we have bring people from uh, stakeholders from the think tank, from the arena, from the 
academic arena, but also from the political arena for members of the, of the European uh, Parliament. And in this first panel, we have uh, two speakers. One will be Camino Montera, who is head of the Brussels Office at the Center for European Reform in Brussels. Camino works on European justice and home affairs with particular focus on migration, data protection, internal security, criminal law, and police and police cooperation. And she has been working on sustainability and publishing on rule of law and its implications. And then our second speakers will be, second speaker will be Daniel Hetegus, who is a visiting fellow for the Central European, Central Europe, sorry, at the German Marshall Fund. And he writes and speaks extensively on populism and democratic backsliding in Central and Eastern Europe and the European and foreign affairs of the Visegrad uh, countries. So I'm going to give the floor to them. And uh, before I do that, just remind the audience that they can raise their questions in the, in the um, facility that is provided by the program at the end of the, of the page. And I will convey those questions to the, uh, the speakers. And the other will be Camilo will be speaking first and then Daniel afterwards, and they are expected to talk around 15 minutes each. So a little bit of limited. So thank you very much, both of you, for being with us here. And Camino, the first is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Carlos. And, and, and thank you, everybody, um, for allowing me to speak in this amazing um, stellar panel. Um, right. So. I um, I feel a little bit like an impostor today uh, because I was asked to speak about the origins of the conditionality mechanism. Um, and I mean, not to worry, I will talk about that, uh, that's for sure. I'm a thin tanker, so that's what we do. Um, but much like Putin in Crimea, I wasn't there. Although I like Putin, I'm actually willing to admit that I wasn't there. Because while the conditionality mechanism was being negotiated, and you know, all you guys were writing about it, or even like in the negotiations, I was doing two very different and all-consuming things. One was having a baby. And the other one was trying to survive a global pandemic with said baby and his two and a half year old brother. So you can imagine the stress when upon coming back to work, I realized not only that I have to get up to date on all questions about pandemic, borders, Schengen, you name it, uh, these things that I do, uh, also recovery funds and all these kind of things, but also I had to learn about the conditionality mechanism and um, the ins and outs of the latest Buhaha in between Varso and Budapest and on the one hand and, and Brussels on the other hand, and something called the own resources ceiling decision, which I have never heard in my life because I am not a budget expert. So what I did, I spent a lot of time with him and I worked the phones because as you know, we couldn't work much more since we were locked at home. And I tried to understand as much as possible what was happening, how we got there, and why. And what follows is the results of a lot of research and plenty of conversation. So I am also really happy to be in a panel today that looks at the past and not at the future, um, because um, I had set aside some time to look at this yesterday. I was also supposed to be writing a piece on the conditionality mechanisms yesterday. And you can imagine how all these plans went to hell when Russia decided to invade Ukraine. And if I may just insert a little bit of current affairs in here, I think that the 24th of February is going to be a before and after um, when it comes to coalitions of power uh, in the European Union on everything from migration to the rule of law to the discussion on the fiscal debates. So it's going to be even more complicated now to make any predictions on how this or other things will pan out in the coming months, um, given the situation. But hey, back to the conditionality mechanism. I'm just looking at the past, so I'm very happy about it. 
um, I decided that um, you guys know where we're coming from. So I um, decided that perhaps the added value that I could have in this conversation was to frame the discussion um, a little bit um, on the background, against the background of how conditionality relates to corruption and how corruption relates to the rule of law. And these are two topics I've done a lot of research on, and I think that I feel a little bit less of an impostor uh, talking about them. Well, perhaps one of the most serious risks of corruption is that it contributes to the erosion of the rule of law by diminishing trust in institutions and governments. Actually, according to a recent, um, a recent um, European Parliament survey, a, a sizable majority of Europeans, around 77%, think that the European Union should only give money to those governments that respect the rule of law. And that, of course, includes uh, the fight against corruption. Um, sorry, I'm having issues with my computer to, this morning. Um, there was another poll which was published a, a little bit uh, not, not uh, some, some time ago uh, in November 2020 by the European Council of Foreign Relations and show that 38% of citizens in Austria, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, the, the Netherlands, Poland, and Sweden thought that the biggest risk to the European uh, post-pandemic recovery funds was actually um, that it may be wasted or end up in the hands of corrupt politicians. Um, so as you can see, waste and corruption are sort of the biggest concerns of voters to these member states when it comes to the recovery funds. The second biggest concern being that the European Union will spend too much money on post-pandemic recovery. So in my view, these figures show that corruption represents one of the most dangerous threats to the quality of a country's institutions and public trust in them. And now it, it may of course be possible to have systems which have corruption and a functioning rule of law, or conversely, not too much corruption, but a lack of rule of law. And that's you know, often the dichotomy that we, that we face when we talk about Hungary and Poland. However, I don't believe that you can separate corruption from the rule of law, right? Uh, in general, the more pervasive the corruption, the more it endangers the rule of law. So we have, for example, you know this better than I do, the Venice Commission, Commission which is the Council of Europe Advisory um, Body on Constitutional Matters, says that um, the rule of law has six elements. One is legality, second, legal certainty, third, provision of arbitrariness, access to justice before independent and impartial courts, respect for human rights, and non-discrimination and equality before the law. So I I took corruption, an, an example of corruption that I'm quite familiar with um, as a Southern European, perhaps. Uh, and I thought this case of corruption could just basically jeopardize one or several of those elements. For example, think of a bribe to a local councillor in Spain's Costa del Sol, right? In exchange for a permit to build a hotel in a protected area. It just this would breach four of those principles of rule of law legality because the councillor would change the administrative act classifying the area as protected. Legal certainty, because a protected area where citizens could expect to enjoy nature would disappear. The provision, prohibition of arbitrariness, the councillor is abusing his or her power and non-discrimination because the city would only allow companies which pay a fee to build hotels and profit from them. Now, corruption also weakens democracy, and we have several indices looking about that. Uh, the Economy's Intelligence Unit is one of them. Uh, it ranks countries according to the health of five elements, electoral processes, pluralism, functioning of government, political participation, political culture, and civil liberties. And it shows that political culture and political participation are more risk in countries where corruption is pervasive. And conversely, the countries, um, the, the indexes top countries are also amongst the EU's least corruption countries. Now, you may wonder why am I going to 
about corruption so much. I do think that corruption is um, sort of the basis of, um, of the baseline of the conditionality mechanism is at the basis of it. And it was chosen as well as one of the ways to give a sort of body to the principle of the rule of law. For the EU institutions, it's easier to sort of convince their colleagues that they worry about corruption rather than about the rule of law, which is maybe more abstract because they do have numbers. Corruption is costly. It's linked to cross-border crime. It is actually a crime. It's actually a euro crime as, as, um, as the commission, or uh, the, 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 actually the legislation says, and sometimes involves EU funds. And that's where the conditionality uh, mechanism comes. And in recent years, it has become really clear that there is a direct causal connection between corruption and democratic backsliding in some European countries. And I think that that was even uh, more um, visible, more apparent uh, when the pandemic hits. Um, so as I was saying, there is this huge link between the fight against corruption and the rule of law. And this connection became really more apparent um, during uh, the negotiations of the conditionality mechanism, which is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so we all know, I mean, you were there, I wasn't, <laughs> but you all know that um, it took considerably considerable political capital from all EU institutions, including the German presidency of the council and the member states to forge an agreement on the recovery funds because it involves transfers between member states and EU borrowing from the financial markets. The agreement, as you know, also included some vague wording about the need to link payments to rule of law requirements. Um, besides the fact, beyond the fact that obviously the regulation has been had been being negotiated for a long time, in November 2020, those vague words were given substance in the so-called rule of law conditionality mechanism, which, um, as I explained to you, you know, I'm, I write for the non-initiated, as we say, so I explain it like this, it's a new regulation that demands compliance uh, with the rule of law principles for EU funds to be dispersed. So we have Budapest and Barso opposing the regulation, which was ultimately agreed by qualified majority voting, as you all know. Um, both Poland and Hungary threatened to veto the law that allowed the European Union to go to financial markets to raise the money for the recovery funds, so the own resources ceiling decision, because obviously they could not uh, veto the actual conditionality uh, mechanism, since it was a QMV. Now, the Polish and Hungarian governments, and we are going to talk about this at length um, afterwards, because we are going to analyze the ECJ ruling that all of us here have probably read several times, um, had basically a number of um, very illiberal, but not um, completely outlandish. I know that I disagree with some of my colleagues here. Um, legal arguments that the, the European Court of Justice had to examine at length. Um, so basically they claimed um, the regulation did not have the right legal basis because it was not referred to the protection of the budget to which the commission, the courts clarified this is not true. Actually, you know, we are going to stop the link to the budget very clearly here so that we agree that the basis, legal basis in the treaty is correct. And then they also um, sort of argue that um, it was a um, sort of lex speciali, so it was a way of making Article 7, um, of developing Article 7 um, to a way that the European Union was not allowed to do in some sort of ultra vires um, way. Obviously, um, the courts dismiss both arguments, uh, finding that um, this uh, conditionality are, um, mechanism is uh, basically only applicable when it comes to the mismanagement of EU funds, uh, so by, by doing that, it established that it was, uh, it was the correct legal basis and plus it was, um, it was um, not a development of Article 7, which is there to uh, punish breaches of EU law. This is really a huge summary um, because it's not my place to talk about this. Um, second panel will, will talk about this, but just so, so you know what kind of arguments um, Poland and Hungary put forward there. Uh, to veto um, to veto the regulation. So obviously, um, eventually we were at a very difficult time, and I, I, I want to take us all back to a very defining moment 
of, um, of um, the past couple of years. This was December 2020. We had to approve the budget. Um, if the budget was not approved, the recovery fund would not have been approved. And the recovery fund for many member states and many analysts, including myself, is a huge uh, leap forward, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of the way it's governed and in terms of the way things can evolve uh, from now on in terms of fiscal transfers and uh, you know, working towards a real fiscal union. So it was a big thing. Uh, it was a big thing um, at a moment where vaccines were announced, but we were not sure that they were going to, to help. It was a big thing at a moment in which the U Europeans were tired, Europeans were scared. There was a lot of money um, on, on, on skiing on the game, a lot of people uh, on forelog, a lot of people um, having to go on temporary um, uh, sort of like um, retirement or whatever. Um, and people were really, really invested in this. I think it would have been politically impossible for the German presidency, and now is when I have my very politically incorrect opinion, and that's all my colleagues in the second panel are going to fiercely disagree about, uh, but that's what panels are about, right? So um, I think it would have been extremely impossible, uh, extremely difficult, sorry, for the German presidency of the European Union to have accepted um, a complete veto to the own resources um, decision, um, so that um, they would have been blamed, the European Union would have been blamed for not being able to agree on a recovery fund that had been sort of like being out there uh, for, for, for months and was the big hope for many Europeans which were suffering uh, pretty much. I think the compromise um, that uh, the European Council uh, found, the German, uh, the German uh, presidency, which, as you know, was to sort of add uh, a paragraph saying that the conditionality mechanism will not be activated until if and until there was a case before the ECJ examining its um, legality and so that the Commission would have enough time to write precise guidelines. I thought, and I thought that at the time, and I still think that this was um, sort of the right way to the right way to um, um, to go around it because um, at that moment there were very very um, very other clever ways to sort of you know overcome the veto and I think the idea and I think they have vindicated uh, in the views the idea was that um, you know we are going to delay the the the, the activation of this mechanism, but perhaps we can use all things. And that's where my theory of the Commission was already knowing that uh, the recovery fund could be used uh, to stop some funding for countries which did not apply the rule of laws, especially in terms of uh, the independence of the judiciary and things like that, um, was already in the minds of some of these people. And eventually they were right. I understand that um, from the pure rule of law warriors, point of view, um, it's an appeasement mechanism. It's difficult to justify, but at the same time, I think that we need to be realistic and retroact ourselves to December 2020 and think what would have we done in their place. Now, uh, just a, a very quick, um, a very quick line on the European Council conclusions and uh, just to to, to underline that, of course, as we all know as well, uh, the UCO conclusions do not have legal value, they're not binding, so they can only provide policy guidelines, and that has been really also a, a huge criticism from um, sort of the lawyer camp of the rule of law, because um, the commission decided to not activate the mechanism where, she, where, where the commission itself was actually allowed to have done so because there was nothing in this compromise that would have tied her not to, sorry tied the commission I, I call her I call her <laughs> um, not to do it um, but again I think I think lots of us discount um, the importance of compromises and politics and the importance that the European Council and the Council of Ministers have in this discussion uh, because these are governments and of course you know I don't like the Orban government. I don't like Morawiecki's government either. 
Uh, but I think we need to understand, and I'm going to finish with this. Um, I think we need to understand that at the end of the day, um, these are governments and not countries. And governments sort of like have a tendency to, you know, not be in power uh, forever unless you're Putin. Um, and then what's left is to deal with the country. So the least you alienate voters and the least you alienate people that you want to support, the better it's going to be for you when it comes to your future relationship uh, with these countries. Um, so I'm going to finish here. I'm, I'm not sure whether I uh, maybe overstepped my time. Sorry for that, um, but I hope that was useful. Okay. Thank you, Camino. That was very good uh, to you as well. And thank you also for reminding me that uh, something I say wrongly, which is that uh, the Hungarian police uh, government threatened to be to the regulation, and certainly was the old resources were were together in a very tight package. So there were four elements in that uh, in that packages. And I don't think you were really, uh, at least from my point of view, that you were really politically incorrect. I also have similar views on the on the position of the commission. Although I would like to press you afterwards in the in the question time, uh, asking for your opinion about the performance on the underlying commission in this specific uh, period. But let's let's leave that for the questions. And now let's move to uh, to Daniel for his take on the commission. So Daniel, thank you very much. The floor is your please. Thank you so much, Professor Closer. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for having me in this Reconnect workshop as not a lawyer, as a political scientist, and for the opportunity that I can speak together with so brilliant speakers who will attend the two panels of this workshop. Um, I also have to admit that I find it challenging to refocus my thoughts after the past uh, 72 hours uh, on the protection of the rule of law within the European Union while we are real time watching the most blatant violation uh, of the founding principles of our post-1945 international peace order by the regime of, of Vladimir Putin. And of course, I also share the impostor syndrome of, uh, of Camino because I wasn't there either by the inception of the conditionality regulation. But I will do also my best to fulfill the task of, of tracing the political dynamics and conflicts that went along with the creation of the conditionality regulation since its, since its inception in 2018. And while I did do exactly that, I will try to fit it into a broader frame and narrative of the rule of law protection in the European Union. And the main point, what I would like to support with, with all of my arguments and the example of the rule of law conditionality regulation is that the protection of rule of law in the European Union is at least as much, if not more, a political issue than, than a legal one. And if I'm saying that the protection of the rule of law in the EU is a political issue, I am not stating that party political or ideological biases are influencing the legislation and decision making. I will not focus on the European People's Party at all. That's the single time that I just mention uh, such political formations. My statement can be interpreted rather in two different dimensions. The first one, I argue that the protection of the rule of law is subject to the institutional political dynamics, conflicts and competition in the institutional triangle of the EU between the Commission, the European Parliament and the Council. And in the frame of this competition, EU institutions exploit the question of the rule of law protection and shape their own institutional responses to these legislative procedures or the enforcement processes in accordance uh, to their interest in extending or protecting their own institutional prerogatives. And second, I'm arguing that the protection of the rule of law is subject to a grand scheme of interaction between member states and the EU institutions, very much uh, in the sense as Camino already mentioned it, and that this grand scheme is best described by the integration theory of new intergovernmentalism. And in this scheme of interaction, the modus operandi is compromise seeking and consent building. And the European Commission is also integrated in this scheme. The European Commission is not a fully independent supranational guardian of the treaties that only considers legal merits and arguments, legal arguments in its enforcement praxis. In fact, the Commission's enforcement praxis uh, Made, it, made the focus be on, on infringement procedures 
on, on the Article 7 proposal in the case of Poland or just in our case, the rule of law conditionality regulation, that enforcement praxis is part of the big compromise seeking machinery of the European Union and of new intergovernmentalism, as it was also convincingly demonstrated by, by the latest paper of Professor Erdaniel Kellerman. And of course, there's just a very brief disclaimer, representatives of the Hungarian and Polish governments also very often complain due to the politicized nature of the rule of law protection. My arguments point in the opposite direction. I argue that the existing form and level of politicization actually blocks, hampers, hinders the effective protection of the rule of law. Uh, and I think that it will also block and hinder in the future uh, after the last week's crucial CGEU ruling as well. Um, of course, over the years, research conducted by Professor Klosa, Professor Kellerman, Ulrich Zedelmeier, Agnes Bathory, a couple of, of other important authors, myself, identified numerous political variables that influenced EU legislation and the enforcement of the rule of law compliance um, over the period of the past 12 years of autocratization within the European Union. And in my introduction, I only would like to demonstrate very briefly uh, how these political variables or different political variables, but especially the competition in the institutional triangle influenced the saga of the conditionality regulation and in four different phases during the inception phase in 2018 that led to the commission proposal second in the legislative phase during 2020 third in the context of the december compromise and fourth of course during the later non-implementation of the regulation uh, until the recent cgeu ruling or perhaps even after that uh, and as I briefly touched upon it, I would like to emphasize that the core of the analysis is not retrospective at all. Uh, in my humble opinion, and potentially that will be provocative, uh, the only single year uh, when, when in some respect uh, the Commission had a kind of more or less convincing legal excuse for, for the non-implementation of the condition and the regulation, was the last year with the Hungarian and Polish action for annulment case. Uh, now we have a legal clarity that the regulation is fully in line with the treaties. We have the legal clarity that from Article 2 TEU, concrete legal obligations are stemming for the member states. Uh, but I think that the consequence of that legal clarity won't be the committed application of the regulation. The main consequence of the ruling is that the primacy of political factors is reinstated on the European agenda. And these political factors, majorities in the Council, compromise seeking, uh, the appropriateness of timing, will decide whether at all, if yes, when, in which extent, and again, against what countries will the European Commission propose sanctions potentially in the future. And starting with the inception period, I would like to emphasize that uh, together with the rule of law review cycle, the conditionality regulation was proposed by, by an outgoing European commission, which was rather unsuccessfully embroiled in the rule of law conflict with Hungary and, and Poland. And its attempt was to make both the next commission involved in that fight, and also to provide the next commission with a more effective toolkit to enforce compliance. However, even at that time, Kimlian Shapely, Laurent Pesch, and, and Erdaniel Kellerman convincingly demonstrated the European Commission wasn't necessarily in the need of a new legal instrument to acquire the competence of suspending EU funds if member states violate the principle of, uh, uh, of the rule of law, and it has an, uh, an impact on, uh, uh, on the financial uh, interest of the European Union. As they argued, the common provision regulations already provided the Commission those power. And that they were right is convincingly supported by the actual 2021 suspension of the European recovery funds, that it can be done in the normal framework of fin financial management rules uh, of the European Union. The policy what the European Commission pursued in 2018 
was what many scholars, scholars called the emulation of the protection of the rule of law. They focused on the development of, of a new instrument instead of the, the use, the committed use uh, and implementation of the existing ones because the, implement, because the development of, of new legal tools for the protection of rule of law is a less conflict-laden process in the European Union institutional system and, uh, uh, and uh, the network with the uh, exchanges and political exchanges uh, networks with the member states uh, than the enforcement of the rule of law. And uh, it is obvious if we take a look, for example, on the infringement track record of that past Juncker Commission. They already have had that tools in the toolkit, like Article 260 TFEU, for example, or the use of uh, interim measures, which were first ever triggered and, uh, and implemented by the European Commission in its enforcement praxis in 2021. So even that time, most of the available tools remained unexploited. I am, I am not arguing in the direction that the inception of the rule of law conditionality regulation was in a, good, was in a bad fate. I am also not arguing in the direction that it was uh, useless, because it's, uh, it's a matter of fact that under the common provision regulation, the suspension of the EU funds could be only temporarily. And it's also a matter of fact that the financial penalties under uh, Article 260 TFEU cannot be compared in their size and amount uh, to the potential financial sanctions imposed under the rule of law condition and the regulation. Even a 1 million euro daily penalty under Article 260 barely has any real impact on the financial cost benefits calculation uh, of, uh, of autocratizing member states, while potentially with the new mechanism, even a larger part um, of, uh, of financial allocations can be suspended at once. But it's a matter of fact that, uh, that the policy that time of the European Commission was rather to push responsibility for uh, deeper political conflicts with member states um, on the shoulders of the next European Commission entering office in, in 2019. When we take a look on, on the legislative phase, uh, of course, first, we have to mention that because the regulation was part of the MFF package, uh, the debate on, uh, on the Commission position with regard uh, to the regulation only unfolded in early 2020, with a huge debate whether at all there will be a support during the MFF negotiations to have the regulation as part of the MFF package. In, in this regard, the July European Council meeting could reach a compromise with such an enigmatic conclusion that no one really was able to tell in the aftermath what does it mean for the decision-making processes, with what majority should, for example, uh, the new regulation be adopted, and, uh, and whether there will be an opportunity to veto the regulation as a part of the whole MFF package, which, of course, should be adopted in the European Council uh, with consent. And in the aftermath of that, practically the German Council presidency, um, in, in a very intergovernmental manner, only tried to seek for a compromise within the Council, within the member states, without any broader respect for uh, the original Commission proposal and the need in the European Union to create effective mechanisms for the protection of the rule of law, because they only feared uh, the possibility of a potential Hungarian and Polish veto for the MFF package. And that was the first point when I think during the past 12 years, the politicization of the rule of law protection contributed in a positive sense uh, to the whole process. Because in September 2020, after the German, uh, German presidency's compromise text was published, there was a huge pushback from the European Parliament and also from a couple of Friends of Rule of Law member states, but first and foremost by the Netherlands, who officially or unofficially, but also threatened with an MFF veto uh, if this voted down text will be the basis 
of the rule of law conditionality uh, legislation. And that political pressure resulted in the compromise version uh, of, uh, of November 2020, which of course was still voter down in many respects, and most importantly, uh, in connection with the decision-making procedure that the, the further reverse qualified majority mechanism was now changed to a simple qualified majority decision-making process, which made practically member states in the council, the main decision-making actors uh, with regard to the introduction of, uh, of potential sanctions. But, but nevertheless, it was a huge political success for the European Parliament. And I think that's the inception moment of that political strategy, that what we are able to observe since then in the case of the European Parliament, that they realized that putting political leverage on the European Commission and putting political leverage uh, on different member states is really the only strategy uh, how the protection of rule of law can be enhanced uh, within the European Union, because without that political pressure, without that politicization, we are practically uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in a petrified and paralyzed uh, uh, mode. Um, my time is, is running out, so I just very briefly would like to, to refer on some of the points what, uh, what Camino uh, already mentioned with regard to the December Compromise. Um, I think it is very important to note, and as this, this uh, argument was already made by Alberto Alemano in the very days uh, of, uh, of this compromise, that from a legal perspective, it is at least a, a dubious political deal because it seriously undermines the independence of the European Commission uh, and, uh, and practically suspends by a non-legislative organ of the European Union the implementation of the legal norm, which was adopted in a normal legislative procedure. However, I think the political uh, conclusions of, uh, of this compromise and later of the non-implementation of the mechanism uh, are twofold. I only would like to uh, briefly mention these two, uh, these two conclusions, and uh, then I will wrap up uh, from my end. And the first one is that although there were political opportunities in December 2020 to not to make a bad and weak compromise on the protection of EU values, and that would be, for example, the creation of an intergovernmental next generation EU package, an intergovernmental Corona recovery fund among the EU 25, and practically uh, pressure Hungary and Poland to seize their veto with uh, the perspective that they can be excluded from the Corona recovery measures. Uh, the political risk of that escalation was never taken for the very simple reason, which are the fundaments of new intergovernmentalism, that both for the European Commission and the other member states, undermining the trust among the member states and with the EU institutions by disregarding, or in the first case, by forging and later by, uh, by disregarding the, the EU code deal, or by creating conflicts, by pushing out the countries from, from the recovery package, uh, appeared to be a much more dangerous political development within the framework uh, of the European Union than practically allowing the systemic violation of the rule of law by autocratizing member states. Of course, that was a cost-benefit calculation, but, uh, but the main outcome of that cost-benefit calculation was that keeping the compromise machinery of uh, of new intergovernmentalism is more important than, uh, than the protection of the EU fundamental values. And where the only single point where I uh, disagree with Camino uh, and potentially partially also with Professor Klose is that I think that this December compromise is still valid and it's still binding the European Commission's behavior in many respects because uh, the current excuse used by the Commission for the non-immediate triggering of the regulation is still that they have to work on the guidelines. The guidelines, which are not the prerequisites of the implementation 
rooted in the original text of the regulation, but only uh, um, introduced by the December compromise. Of course, the European Commission has many internal guidelines. The infringement procedures, application of Article 258, 260 is, is also regulated with internal guidelines. But these guidelines were created post festa in some cases, even decades after the original legal text were born and their application started. These guidelines from a legal perspective shouldn't constitute a prerequisite of the application of the regulation, but the European Commission insists on that. And I think we'll still continue insisting on that uh, in the upcoming months, practically still further suspending the application of the condition and regulation. Uh, I'm really sorry for that. Um, the short time doesn't allow me to cover all of the details uh, of these four phases, but I'm happy to revert to any points further in the discussion. I would like to close my introduction with a, with a conclusion uh, which reverts back to my original theoretical point, and that is that under the conditions of new intergovernmentalism, the prerequisites of an effective protection of the rule of law are not given and cannot be guaranteed in the European Union. To achieve that goal, we simply need a political and institutional change. And no CGEU ruling will be able ever strategically alter the picture without political will uh, on part of the member states. We need first that autocratization in EU member states becomes a fear, firm part of the domestic political agenda in other EU countries. We need agenda setting, we need politicization, we need political entrepreneurship related to the protection of rule of law and other EU values at domestic level in the EU 25 or later in case of potential political changes in Hungary and Poland 26 or 27 perhaps. And the second point that the effective enforcement of the compliance with rule of law needs a more independent and more supranational guardian of the treaties, like the European, Un uh, European Commission used to act, for example, in the pre-Maastricht era. We need a guardian of the treaties, which is primarily led by legal considerations and not by dubious political compromises in its enforcement practices. Only member states can trigger this development. Member states can come to the conclusion that the protection of EU values in the current modus operandi of the European Union is difficult, even if not impossible. If the past 12 years were not able to teach that lesson, or at le least to, to start that sort of thinking in the respective uh, national elites, that I don't know what further inputs are needed in, in this regard. But uh, I think that uh, such a political need is simply unavoidable. Um, the protection of the rule of law should be more or should become more illegal than a political issue. It should be the opposite of the situation what I described at the beginning of uh, my presentation, but we are not there yet. Still today, the protection of rule of law in the European Union is overwhelmingly a political issue. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Daniel, for this very extensive and, and deep uh, engagement with the issues. And uh, when I was listening to you, I, I thought that at the same time you were you were arguing two opposite standpoints. You said that politicization block. Um, in enforcement of law, but at the same time, we're calling for further politicization <laughs> to secure enforcement. So you are doing one thing and the opposite. I myself, in you know, those who think that politicization is, is further required uh, to, to secure a more effective enforcement, but perhaps the focus of politicization should change and the focus should be national goals. Uh, we need to understand why certain governments are reluctant to really to take uh, a stronger action against. Uh, those who breach uh, these fundamental values of the union and that i think that's the real response why specific countries why specific governments sorry are not prepared to go along the way to really use the instruments to enforce 
uh, rule of law. I think that the uh, criticism of the commission, yes, I have done that, and many of us have done that, but uh, I, in that I, I perhaps I, I feel closer to coming when I think, you know, there is a little bit of that, and I say that you cannot criticize, you should criticize the commission, but I'm not totally sure that is the only responsible actor. And, uh, and uh, on the other hand, I am very hesitant on performing rule of law, scrutiny and enforcement a purely legal affairs. I think there are questions about the kind of union that, that creates is a totally federal instrument. And I'm not really sure whether we can do that now. Whether it's deceivable, that's a different discourse, but whether we can do that now with the current instruments, I, I have many doubts, but that would be an interesting matter for discussion. But let me turn back to, to Camino because I, I promised to raise to her the question on the commission that also Daniel pointed towards you. And uh, I wanted to hear your views. You said you weren't there, but you are here now. And uh, I wanted to hear your views. What do you think that uh, will be the performance of the commission after this rule? And uh, I know I'm pointing you not only to the present, but towards the future, but uh, being uh, someone who works in the environment of policy analysis, probably is a, is a kind of common invitation something that you have heard before. So do you think that the Bandarlegi Commission would be more prepared to use the conditionality regulation now that the court has cleared the path, or as uh, Daniel argued, they are hiding behind the guidelines as an instrument that allows them not to take any, any action. What will be your, your focus? And a second question that also for you will be also something that you said uh, on voters. And, uh, you said that perhaps it would be better not to punish, uh, not to punish the citizens, the voters, and have their support. And that, that's an argument that has been repeated by many, but I think Dimitri Koshero is the one that I heard more often say that thing. And here I want to be very provocative and even a little bit politically incorrect. Um, you, certain governments are elected by uh, electoral majorities, right? So to a certain extent, we're speaking of uh, cities that have at least a small responsibility in the kind of governments they have. So if that is the case, uh, is it true that we should be prepared for those citizens to share, to take the share of uh, mechanism, enforcement instruments that uh, create some kind of punishment? Otherwise, we are creating a kind of Peter Pan democracy, you know, that uh, we elect leaders, but we don't have any responsibility on their behavior. That would be a kind of a very strange uh, perception. But please, Camino, the floor is yours for this one. And let me just remind everyone that uh, the, the, the Q&A section is open for your, uh, for your own questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carlos. Um, yes. So two things and um, this is going to um, be very helpful for me because I also want to talk about politicization and I think that will come into your question about voters. So what will the commission do? Um, that's a question that obviously everybody wants to know. Um, you can ask commission officials themselves, they'll probably tell you we don't know yet. I think and I, I do think I can emphasize this enough what happened yesterday, yesterday is going to make a huge difference on the weeks and the months to come um, because we are seeing a realignment of uh, positions in all things from migration to the rule of law to who wants to be in the European Union to how good the European Union is. Um, so I think there's a lot of unknowns at the moment on what's going to happen in general within the European Union and within the relationship in between governments at the time. Uh, now, if you have asked me this question a couple of days ago, when we knew that Putin was going to invade, but we didn't know what went, so it was more of a hanging threat. Um, I'd say, um, and I, I, I'm now alone in this proposition, I think the Commission is doing a good job. And I know that all my colleagues working on the rule of law disagree on this. Um, I think the Commission is doing a good job because I think the Commission is being very clever. Um, it has not used the conditionality mechanism because of the compromise that they reached in, in, um, in December, but also because I think they are aware themselves that you know, this conditionality mechanism is not as far reaching as um, some people make it to be. <clears throat> and they have used instead the recovery funds. 
And the recovery funds, um, it's something that um, to me, and that's like, I, I know that I'm in the minority here with a bunch of like Anglo-Saxon people. Uh, so we're probably the outsiders um, in this debate, but the, the recovery fund is to me um, a good way to do this, this kind of things. Because I think one of the problems that we have in this, in this uh, debate, and because I, I talk a lot to Eastern European colleagues and, and I'm very much in contact with them, um, it's a question of how do we communicate, how do we talk about this, and, when, and how, how do we insist on the values point of view, right? And whereas I think that all of us would agree that the European Union is a community of values, one of these values is the rule of law, of course, um, if you talk to the other side, um, you would get all this disinformation, you know, campaigns, whatever you, you want to call it, but that work there, that sort of tell you, yeah, but this community of values is going to end up making us do things that we don't want to do. We didn't sign up uh, for a community where, you know, gay marriages are legal, whatever, whatever, whatever. I disagree with this approach, but I understand this approach. And I think that's something that, you know, the Commission has taken very much and that is doing in a very clever political way. Because by using the recovery fund, which is completely linked to the European semester and hence linked to very clear indicators and very you know, measurable things of, you cannot spend this money if you don't have an authority, authority sorry, that is going to be able to monitor how you spend that money. And effectively we have ruling saying that you don't, so we can fuel this money to your country. Point blank, we're not talking about values we're not talking about you know anything about democracy a liberal democracy whatever this is a very strict thing that we are doing this way so i think in my view and if i had to bet once again i think that yet yesterday changed everything so perhaps things are going to change but i think the consensus um amongst um those working on this is that um the commission will uh trigger action against hungary before it does against poland because uh, the link in between corruption that I was talking about before um, and, um, and uh, well, the conditionality mechanism itself is going to be easier to prove. Uh, my question is, and I have had people from the Commission answering in different directions, my question has been, uh, will the Commission trigger uh, before or after the Orban elections? That's a question. The, the elections are the 3rd of April, so they're um, coming coming up. And I think that, again, this, this point is moot at the moment, um, given the extent of Putin's actions and the way that countries are realigning uh, into different coalitions of power. So that's for the Commission. And then for um, the voters' question, I um, wrote a piece in November, which was called How to Solve a Problem Like Poland. Nothing original, uh, but it was um, after the the Constitutional Tribunal, um, um, tribunal sorry, um, ruling on poll exit, so to speak. Um, and there I argued for a three-point strategy, which I think is still valid. And this goes uh, as well to the point of politicization. I think in order to deal with something like what was happening in Poland with all this uh, back and forth with the courts and stuff, um, the first point is to use peer pressure. And peer pressure cannot come from the commission, it has to come from um, heads of the state and governments. I was extremely disappointed when I, um, when I saw the reaction to that uh, tribunal uh, ruling, because I was not expecting member states to go on a rant about the validity of EU law or supremacy of EU law or something academic like that, but I thought that it would have been really easy to issue a um, statement saying we members of the European Union believe in <laughs> Article 1 of the Treaty of the European Union that says we are a community of values, you know, like basically we are just a, a club of countries doing this and that. That it would have been a factual statement and that would have lent so much more credibility to the movement that was behind that. So that was the first, um, the first thing that I thought um, should be done. Peer pressure coming from political leaders, hence the European Council and the Council of Ministers. The second one, um, it's legal action. Okay, fine, you can use all the technicalities that you want, conditionality, infringement procedures, Article 7, whatever you, you want to call it. I think this is not going to succeed um, in uh, bringing them in line alone. And that's where I come to the third question, which is communication with the Polish uh, people. In that case, I was talking about Poland. So 
communicating with the Polish people and try to make them understand, because I think that there's a huge misunderstanding here in Brussels, um, that um, this is not against them, but for them, that um, the question of restricting money is not to punish the Polish people, it's actually to um, try to make their government use the money that they're stealing from them in the right way. And I think that doesn't get communicated correctly in, in here. Uh, during that time, there was a lot of calls, unfortunately, especially in French speaking uh, media here uh, for Eastern European uh, countries to um, leave the European Union. Yesterday, still I had to fight some tweets, uh, Twitter trolls um, um, arguing for that uh, when it came to the Putin invasion, like we wouldn't be in this position if we didn't have, uh, you know, Eastern European countries uh, in the European Union. I think that debate is toxic. And I think that um, that brings us nowhere. And that only contributes to um, alienate and, and polarize society in those countries, in particular in Poland and Hungary. And in the case of Poland, it also contributes to the risk, which I think is very high, of radicalizing further elements of the coalition government. And I'm not necessarily talking about the law and justice one, and elements of the society. And that is not what we need. But once again, I mean, this was an analysis that was that could have been done two days ago. Now I have no idea what's going to happen uh, because of, um, of of Putin. We might as well, um, you know, be before a renaissance of the European Union and of NATO. And, you know, we will all uh, realize how horrible it is to be an autocrat and how many lives that can cost. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Camino. Um, Daniel. Um, you can, you can perhaps go on the lines I, I mentioned before, this idea that you systematically criticize politicization, but at the same time you see politicization as the, as the, as the solution. And also, whether the, the emphasis should be put really on national governments rather than in institutions. And there is a question in the chat that is linked to that, and I'm going to take it, uh, to put it together, um, which is about uh, the, 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 the role for the commission as a stronger guardian for the for the treaties and how this can work in connection to particularly with managing managing the funds. I have written in the past that one of the problems with the current setting of the of the union nowadays is that the commission is in fact assuming two very different phases. One is a very political one, which is the inheritance of the movements for direct election of the president of the commission or for the politicization of the commission and so forth. And the other one which comes back from the 50s, which is the very technical um, a kind of agency model in which you are independent from political power and your functions are particularly relevant from the point of view of uh, enforcement. Now, I wonder what you think of that because you call for a more, uh, for a more, if I understand it correctly, for more technical commission with a stronger attitude or a stronger role in enforcing enforcement role. No, calls for a less politicized, totally uh, unpoliticized uh, commission, but that seems to be against the trend of what we have been doing in the last. 20, 30 years in the So I would like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Closa, uh, for this interviewing question. Yes, first, I would like to underline that I think there is no contradiction in the statement that the current level of politicization is blocking the effective protection of rule of law in the European Union, and that we need more politicization to be able to come out of this trap. I think the description of the description of the situation is very similar to that what Er Daniel Kellerman called the authoritarian equilibrium. That we practically keep a kind of hypothesis that political processes are not influencing enforcement. Meanwhile, all of the arguments what for what were mentioned, for example, also by Camino, which will be the variables that may determine the future implementation of the rule of law conditionality regulation were purely political. Um, there is a kind of negative uh, critical mass of different political variables which are already working. And we have to acknowledge that there is no legal way out of the current situation. We need the politicization and the political pressure by member states and by the European Parliament, as it was also more or less visible during 2021 in their behavior, to give a different direction of rule of law enforcement in the European Union. I completely agree with you that what 
I have been demanding at, at the end of my presentation, a bit less political commission is, is not necessarily in line with that and definitely not in line with the development since Maastricht. Because the order based on new intergovernmentalism was created since Maastricht. But that would mean that more or less we are, uh, we are bringing the existing model closer to that hypothesis, which is anyhow proclaimed both by legal scholars and the European Commission itself, that the Commission is a guardian or shall, should be a guardian of the treaties, which not at all political fields, not in its role as, uh, as making proposals for the further de development of various EU policies, but only in its enforcement role should be less politicized and should take or give more attention for the pure legal details when she or it decides about starting infringement procedures or making various steps. And to be honest, I think the, the main hindrance in this regard uh, is the practically unlimited margin of appreciation of the Commission, how it addresses uh, breaches of EU law. And because it is practically uh, embraced by CGU legislation as well, it's, it's very difficult to bring the European Commission out of the present situation, because that would mean that either it returns back to a role model 30 years ago, I underline only in its enforcement practice, or somehow its existing in institutional prerogatives should be constrained or limited, which is definitely a, a no-go, because I think that um, in the institutional triangle, development is possible if more or less all institutions can, can find their own institutional interest in this process. And it also explains why the European Parliament is the biggest supporter of the rule of law initiatives, because the Parliament sees the opportunity how it can expand and enhance its existing institutional prerogatives to that process. And that can be a very delicate compromise finding, but I think that compromise seeking and compromise finding is fundamentally or can should be fundamentally different than the current compromise machinery based on, on new intergovernmentalism. Um, if you allow me, I also would like to touch on, on two distinct points. The first one is the domestic impact and, uh, and uh, the impact of, on the voters of the different sanction measures. First, I think there is a kind of misunderstanding uh, in our argumentation. The suspension of the recovery funds is also a sanction. It also has financial, economic, and domestic consequences, both in Poland and, and Hungary. In this regard, I would argue that the consequences are even deeper than, uh, than those of, uh, of the rule of law conditionality mechanisms were. Um, but there is no clarity why and how in this regard the European Commission is, uh, is acting. Um, I think it's more or less clear that the only way how, for example, autocratizing governments and member states can be influenced is altering their cost benefits calculations. And it can only happen through pressure and sanctions. For the very simple reasons, which is very often uh, left out of consideration in the EU debates, that these are no good faith actors. Uh, and from its institutional culture, European member states and the European Union is not prepared to deal with bad faith actors. And the second uh, issue, which is very often left out of consideration, is that these societies are already polarized and the European Union is already divided. Uh, a large part of the Hungarian and Polish society would expect that the European Commission is acting in a committed way, even through financial sanctions to put pressure on, on the autocratizing governments. So I think we are paralyzed by the experience and the lessons drawn from the 2000 Austrian case, even if these lessons are not necessarily uh, valid anymore. And, uh, and just in, in one phrase, I would like to pick up the question of, uh, of uh, Sinead uh, Mulcahy. How can the politicization at domestic level 
be brought forward. And I just would like to mention two positive examples from the past year from, uh, from the Netherlands and, and Denmark, a research topic uh, I used to recently work on, that in both countries, the national parliaments asked uh, the respective governments to trigger Article 259 TFEU against Poland. That to bring Poland for the various breaches of EU law and rule of law and Article 2 values by their respective national governments. And I think that politicization is needed. We need political entrepreneurship in the national parliaments. We need national MPs who build up a kind of rule of law profile, keep that issues on the agenda, trigger political initiatives, and try to push the national governments to, to act like players. These behavior have very strict limits. And I think it's, uh, it's not, uh, not an accident that we only have a couple of friends of rule of law countries in the European Union and why these countries are always the same. So there are social predeterminants uh, and, and further other variables. But I think that that is the bottom up political process, which can alter first the domestic political agenda in these countries and in a later stage, potentially also the European political agenda as well. Hey, thank you very much, both of you. This has been a, a wonderful conversation, and uh, I, I think we could keep on going for uh, for hours. But the program now uh, has created a space for a coffee break before moving to the next uh, session. So, thank you. It has been really, really interesting for me, and really great. And uh, I look forward to keep this conversation in like uh, around uh, eleven forty-five in a little bit more than uh, twenty-five minutes. Okay, thank you both. Bye. Perfect. Thank Thanks so much. so much. Bye. Bye. Already, thanks so. Welcome and uh, to our reconnect panel entitled Prospect of the Scope of the Conditionality Regulation. My name is Ramona Coman. I am professor of political science at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, and I am delighted to chair this panel. Allow me to start our discussion by expressing my solidarity with Ukraine. This is a dark week for Europe and for the world. We woke up yesterday morning in a new world in which the sovereignty of a country has been violated. Here at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and with our uh, Ukrainian colleagues and students against war and violence. It was important for me to say it. Thank you. The topic of this panel is prospect of the scope of the conditionality regulation. And as we all know, and it has been discussed, uh, more than 10 years have gone since the rule of law has become a bone of contention on the European agenda. 
since 2010, all EU institutional actors have in many ways addressed or avoided addressing the very sensitive question of compliance, lack of compliance with the values enshrined in Article 2 of the EU. What is the outcome? Well, in Poland, the peace government is pursuing its governmental plan in the field of justice, and it is not inclined to follow the recommendations of the Commission on the independence of the judiciary. And in Hungary, the Fidesz party too is sticking to its position. The government pretends to be the true defender of the European values, including the rule of law. Viktor Orban himself portraying, uh, portraying him as a gatekeeper of the European society model. So if the question is, what is the outcome when after 10 years, and if the answer is to see whether or not concerns over uh, respect for EU values have been alleviated, the answer would be uh, an easy no. Still, a number of instruments have been adopted over the last 10 years. The policy instruments designed, however, to prevent the rule of law violations did not reach their goals, either because of a lack of political will or because said instruments were imperfect to begin with. And this is something that the members of the Reconnect pro project have discussed extensively and uh, examined in different ways. The EU's response has been slow to come because the issue has been divisive. It was discussed in the, the panel, uh, in the morning panel, that the issue has been politicized and uh, it has been divisive both within and among EU institutions. Now we have a series of tools and the regulation on the establishment for a, of a conditionality regime for the protection of the EU budget is the last uh, tool uh, added to this uh, series. The regulation has been contested from the very, very beginning. As we all know, after two years of intensive discussions uh, within the Commission, within the Parliament, and even more difficult discussions in the county, this regulation uh, was adopted in December 2020 after many concessions, mainly to Poland and Hungary, but it is important perhaps to say that not only to them. It was adopted finally, as I said, in 2020 to be challenged by, at, at the Court of Justice by Poland and Hungary. The Court of Justice dismissed the action brought by the two countries. The court confirmed the validity of the regulation and I would even say that engaged fully with the claims addressed by Poland and Hungary. Now, since the publication of the rulings of the Court of Justice, the Parliament discussed the implications of the judgments in its plenary session in Strasbourg and the message of the main political groups was that the Commission should act and should act now. Uh, it was also discussed within the Commission, the President announced that the institution, I quote, will carefully analyze the reasoning of the judgments and the possible impact on the further steps, uh, on the further steps. Now the question is, what comes next? And this is why we are here in this panel to discuss and to explore together uh, the likelihood of this regulation to be triggered. Uh, to discuss the consequence of the delay of its activation by the European Commission and also the tensions which emerged between the Commission and the European Parliament in this regard. I would add to this topic and to the presentation of this panel maybe another line uh, which would be to discuss also about the position of member states with regard to the application of this uh, regulation. We have here today um, uh, an excellent panel, um, a member of the European Parliament, very active on this topic, Daniel Feint, or member of the Greens and EFA, member of the Committee on the Budgetary Control and member of the Committee on Constitutional Affairs. Uh, who supported the publication of uh, this report uh, written by uh, colleagues that we all know, uh, Kim uh, Lane Skepel, uh, um, Daniel Kellerman, and one of the panelists today, John Moreno, uh, on the EU Commission, uh, which has to cut funding to the EU, uh, the legal case. So you supported uh, the, this contribution, Daniel uh, Freund. And we have today with us also Professor Petra Bart, uh, who is professor at the CEU and ELTE uh, Law School. Uh, Petra Bart is the author of many, many publications on the rule of law tools, but also on the situation in Hungary. And I would mention here one of the last reports published with Professor Laurent Peck, which is the Commission's rule of law report and the EU monitoring and enforcement of Article 2 uh, EU values. Uh, 
Last but not least, Professor John Moren, Professor at Groningen and Commissioner at the Netherlands Institute for Human Rights, Chair in Law and Politics and International Relations and Assistant Professor of European Human Rights Law. Uh, Professor Moren also wrote many publications and many books, and he is the co-author of this piece, which was written, which has been written. The EU Commission has uh, to cut funding to Hungary, as I mentioned before, uh, co-authored with Kim Lanes Kepel uh, and Daniel Kellerman. So I think we are here today in a great company to discuss this regulation, to discuss the next steps, to discuss the challenges ahead. So I'm delighted to give now the floor for the first round to, uh, uh, of uh, comments to Daniel, uh, Daniel uh, Freund. And then we will follow the order of the program, Petra Bart and uh, John Moran. We will open the floor for questions and uh, comments at the end of the three um, speeches. Please do not hesitate to use the chat box for your questions and remarks. Daniel Freund, you have the floor. Thanks so much for, for having me. And I think uh, you, you started out with the, with the situation in Ukraine. And I think what that really puts in the spotlight is that there is an international struggle, whether democracy, whether the rule of law are, are gonna survive as a system or not. There is forces out there that don't want this, that invade neighboring countries because they are democratic and because they are building uh, rule of law. And, uh, you know, China isn't a democracy and doesn't have rule of law. Uh, and in the US, it was wavering. Uh, and I'm not quite sure, you know, whether whether it will eternally prevail uh, in, in, in the US. So, so, so that's the context for, for the struggle. And you have said uh, that inside the European Union, there, there is countries, there's governments that are uh, on, a, on a different path than what we thought, you know, in the 90s, the end of history, uh, what was uh, going to be the, the, the sense of, of history for, for us, that we have functioning democracies, that we keep, keep building a, a better rule of law. And we have seen in the last years that even inside the European Union, that is not the case and the union has been slow to to respond to that uh, you you have mentioned some of the 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 tools already um we we have the rule of law conditionality for for all of for for more than a year and i think it has been a horrible sign for a conditionality that is supposed to protect the rule of law that the first things that the member states governments did with this is against the rule of law to not apply a regulation that entered into force over 14 months ago. The European Council, the heads of state and government, according to the treaties, have no role in, in legislation. They cannot suspend legislation uh, from, from application, but that is exactly what they have de facto done over the, the past 14 months. And there have been now, including from the French presidency, statements that now that the ECJ has ruled, we've, we have this new tool. That is not what happened. And that's also the reason why the European Parliament is suing the European Commission for inaction, uh, something that we started last summer, uh, because in, in blatant violation of its obligations to protect the treaties and to apply uh, the, the EU legislation that is in force, the Commission hasn't, hasn't done so. We know that at least since October, uh, the cases against Poland and Hungary are ready. I mean, you, you mentioned the study that, uh, that John Moraine and others uh, wrote together, which we had handed over to the Commission in May last year. So almost a year ago, they had the case, uh, but they had the envelopes uh, around the letters already in October, before the October summit. It was that very week that the uh, so-called Polish Constitutional Tribunal ruled uh, on, on that case um, uh, around the supremacy of EU law and the treaty provisions that they then declared, well, not in line with the Polish constitution. And that apparently uh, provoked the exact opposite reaction that one could have expected from Chancellor Angela Merkel. He, she then interfered with the Commission President von der Leyen and, and halted that the, that the conditionality mechanism be triggered in October. They then transformed the letters into those informal letters that don't trigger 
uh, the regulation, but that were sent to, to the Polish and Hungarian governments in, in late October. Um, well, and since then, again, we're, we're waiting. The court ruling is now over a week old. Uh, as you said, the commission said we will we will assess, we will prepare uh, the guidelines. So once again, they find excuses not not to to do anything. If you ask my expectation, I would be surprised if if they trigger the mechanism before the Hungarian elections. I think there is still a bit of a power struggle going on inside the commission, but I I. I, I don't see it at the moment that they uh, that they actually act with the uh, they they say they don't want to interfere in the Hungarian elections. They seem to be seeing no issue with having funded um, the the Hungarian government's holding holding on to power for twelve years now. They know, and all this is in the letter of the Commission itself. They know in great detail that Orban is stealing the money, that Orban is misusing the money to hold on to power. Uh, and, and apparently they, they deem that continuing to send money and knowing that it is be misused to buy the next election is, is, is the smaller interference compared to sending a letter and triggering the rule of law conditionality, knowing full well that even if they trigger today, you know, the, the application of financial sanctions, the, the freezing of EU funds to Hungary is, is at least nine months away. Uh, that's the way that this regulation works, and we have seen the the smartness of the Hungarian governments to drag out the process. Every minute that they can still delay this, they will. They have already signaled now that they, uh, according to their point of view, the the guidelines that are and the court has confirmed that, you know, nowhere in the regulation does the word guideline appear. They are not legally necessary. Um, they should definitely not prevent. The application of the regulation, but the Hungarian government has already said that they don't uh, think that the Commission can adapt uh, adopt its guidelines uh, without first consulting with them again. And probably the Hungarian government will need uh, a couple of months uh, at least to to react to those guidelines. So any delay that they can create, uh, they will. And in a way, Orban has won this this process. All this went exactly according to his plan. When I was negotiating. Uh, the regulation late in 2020. At, at some point, it, it, it must have been very clear to the Hungarian government that they can no longer prevent uh, this re regulation from, from coming eventually. They have severely weakened it already, but they knew they couldn't fully prevent it from, from coming. At that point, the, the main objective for Orban was you know, that nothing happens until he is re-elected for the fourth time. Uh, that will happen in a, in a tiny bit over a month time. And everything looks now as if the commission will not even dare to send another letter uh, to, to him before his re-election. So, so this went for him, I think, fully, fully according to, to, to plan in that sense. And that, despite the, the most severe attacks on, on the rule of law, on the financial interest of the union. I have visited both Hungary and Poland in the last week. And I, I have to say, I mean, reading about the rule of law violations in, in, in the newspaper, in, in all those reports uh, that, that we get, it's one thing. But, but hearing the stories on the ground from those prosecutors in, in Poland that with 48 hours notice are are sent away 300 kilometers from their families, you know, not being able to take care of their children anymore. Um, to to hear the stories of of Hungarian businessmen that are surveyed with methods that even under the worst days of um, of, of communism, you know, basically just technically weren't available to the governments at the time, but that have their their mobile phones hacked. Uh, with Pegasus now that are under full surveillance that have um, cars parked in front of their uh, in front of their houses around the clock to intimidate them that have that come back to their office and see that remotely someone has opened their private Facebook messages on their desktop computer to send a message of we know everything about you um, you know to, to have a situation when you, again, in Poland, you know that illegally appointed judges are on a daily basis producing 
judgments that are also illegal, right? Uh, you know, over over a year now, the the Neo Judicial Council has has been appointing judges that produce in turn all those judgments, and in that situation, to have the Commission tell us we will carefully assess and no case is lost. I mean, it you you cannot just roll back these rule of law violations after afterwards. Um, that's that's the situation. We and the Parliament. Uh, as I said, we have passed resolution after resolution where we're suing the commission, but we are running a bit out of out of width, out, out of possibilities of of what to do other than, you know, now, now we're down to cutting funding to to the commission and I guess ultimately throw out uh, this this commission if they do continue uh, their path of inaction and, and refusing to protect the very foundation of, of, of the European Union. It's, it's, it's really, I have to say, quite, quite shocking to see that. It's good that we have a broad majority in the European Parliament that agrees with this. You know, this is not a political thing in the, in the European Parliament. From the Conservatives to the very left, uh, everyone but the crazies um, agree on, on, on this. Um, and, and I guess now that the ruling is there, the frustration in the parliament is building up uh, every day to finally see action. Obviously, this is not just the commission alone. We know that the, you know, this depends on member states. There, there is good signals there, like the new coalition agreement in, in my own uh, member state in, in, in Germany. But, but nevertheless, it remains frustrating to see how most governments are not willing to, to speak truth, to, uh, to address this openly. You know, we are in a joint union, we're doing legislation together. This is not the internal affairs of any one member state, whether EU law continues to be applied in, in all of our member states. And if the rights of all European citizens are fully respected wherever we go inside this European Union, this is a task for all member states and they have to openly address this and, and, and act accordingly. So I, I really hope uh, that very shortly we, um, we come to a moment where we, we take this rule of law crisis seriously. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, talk. And uh, we have many, many questions. I have myself many questions, but I'd like just to make a short comment before giving the floor to, uh, to Petra, uh, Professor, Professor Petra Bart, is that you mentioned this, um, what happens with judges in Poland. And I just want to take one minute to mention this movie that we have seen here in Brussels, Judges Under Pressure, which tells the stories of many judges in Poland, including the, uh, Igor Tuleya and many, many others. I'm studying the tools of the EU and the rule of law debates from a political science perspective. And I have the feeling that we don't take enough into account that all this debate has also a very important human dimension, social dimension, which is under uh, underestimated in my view. But this said, I would, I'm very, very happy to give now the floor to Petra Bartz uh, uh, for her first comments and reactions. Thank you very much uh, for, for the possibility and what, whatever I say we very much correspond to what Daniel was saying. Um, but I first would like to put this whole conditionality saga into a broader perspective of the problem of separation of powers in the European Union. Then second, I will talk about the, um, about the pros. Uh, of the conditional the regulation itself. And, and, and finally, I would like to say a few words about the uh, judgment that has been rendered uh, a week ago on the um, same instrument and what that might, um, how that might influence the future use of the actual conditionality regulation. So the double nature, um, a lot has already been said in the previous presentation about the double nature of the EU's rule of law problem, which is very much visible or was very much visible during the adoption of the conditionality regulation already. Now, this double nature of the problem is the following. Some nation states, they suffer from a rule of law decline, lack of limitation of governmental powers and separation of powers in general. Now, at the same time, there is a clear risk of the crumbling of separation of powers at the EU level too, where institutions fail to play their part 
and adequately step up against rule of law violations in the multi-level constitutional arena. Now, while in the national setting a power grab can be traced, in the EU an opposite phenomenon can be seen, a failure to act even against constitutional authorization and obligation as foreseen by the treaties. EU institutions, they hide their inaction behind alleged constitutional concerns of vertical separation of powers. They try to legitimize their overcautious approach and lack of dissuasive responses to rule of law violator governments with a very narrow understanding of supranational competences, control of powers, and alleged lack of legitimacy for interfering into domestic affairs. And sometimes even the principle of horizontal separation of powers is violated in order to prevent EU institutions from promptly responding to a rule of law decline. Now, all this could be traced during the drafting of the conditionality regulation. Instead of the original plans of a reverse qualified majority to block the commission, in the revised version, the qualified majority in the council must support the commission's decision for, for it to go into effect. Also, the focus was sh shifted from rule of law to the importance of the protection of unions financial interests in conjunction with the rule of law, of course. And, and, and the conditionality regulation as a consequence became like a, an anti-corruption tool uh, rather than a rule of law enforcement tool, strictly speaking. So rule of law breaches will be sanctions if they affect or seriously risk affecting the budget in a sufficiently direct way. Now, Hungary and Poland, the most likely candidates to be affected by the new rules, threatened to block the approval of the, of the EU seven-year budget, the multi-annual financial framework, and the next generation EU COVID-19 recovery fund if the conditional regulation was adopted in its original form. So they kind of took hostage of the EU institutions and other member states. Um, the next generation EU could have been recreated under enhanced cooperation, probably, even if uh, with great difficulties, but there was no way to circumvent the unanimity requirement for the multi-annual financial framework. And as a political compromise, again, the final text of the conditionality regulation was agreed to be accompanied by guidelines on the way the Commission should apply the regulation. Now, this in many, many aspects uh, violates actually the rule of law. So first, the regulation is binding and effective in its entirety as it stands, irrespective of any further interpretative measures. As Daniel already mentioned, the, de the text of the regulation does not mention any guidelines whatsoever. Um, second, the European Council does not have any lawmaking powers. Therefore, the guidelines can only be interpreted as a step taken out of virus. Third, the European Council cannot give instructions to the Commission that would go beyond its mandate. And, 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 and finally, um, a piece of EU's law, EU law's enforcement is not dependent on an action for um, annulment. This is very clear from Article 278 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, according to which actions before the Court of Justice do not have any suspensory effect. Um, now, the European Parliament, I think, rightly emphasized that the Commission must abide by the law. This means that the conditional regulation should have been enforced as of the 1st of January 2021, irrespectively of any annulment action. And it really is a very regrettable that as things escalated, um, the European Parliament was compelled to start a procedure for failure to act um, under, um, under the EU treaties. Um, now, nevertheless, uh, I see many advantages also uh, with regard to the actual um, regulation 2020-2092. Uh, first of all, uh, it expressly and comprehensively links um, the implementation of the EU budget to compliance with the core principles of the rule of law. Second, it comprehensively codifies for the first time in a legislative instrument, because we have soft instruments before, but now in a legislative instrument, there is a clear um, laying down the meaning and scope of the rule of law in light of the EU treaties and the Court of Justice's jurisprudence. Then it clearly describes in a non-exhaustive manner situations indicative of breaches of the principles of the rule of law. Um, it is also of significant political, legal, and also practical importance to establish the legal relationship between the different instruments available to EU institutions. 
to assess whether and to what extent these instruments could be opera operationalized in parallel so as to ensure a more comprehensive and more robust defense for rule of law principles in the EU legal order. And finally, um, on the plus side, it authorizes a comprehensive, proactive, risk-based approach that facilitates EU intervention to safeguard financial management even before disbursement of EU funds. So in this respect, this is not an ex post facto um, uh, instrument uh, or only. Now, uh, as to the judgment that has been um, delivered last week, um, I think um, the judgment itself, um, uh, I mean, the outcome of the, of the procedure was quite foreseeable. Um, the intention of the Polish and the Hungarian governments were not to win this case. It was just to delay um, the um, invocation of the conditional regulation. I think this was clear for all the parties uh, and also for the court. Um, nevertheless, there are some symbolic, important symbolic aspects of the judgment and also um, some um, important substantive aspects as well. As to the symbolic aspects, <coughs> the number of intervening parties was impressive. Um, the Court of Justice decided the case in an expedited procedure and ordered the applicants to pay the fees of the institutions, which is, which is, um, uh, which is not the regular uh, way of, uh, of, of uh, allocating uh, the costs. I think it just indicates that the court knew that, that the whole uh, procedure was just abusive. Uh, <clears throat> the Court of Justice dismissed the application in its entirety. Um, and when the, when the um, main parts of the of the uh, judgment were read out and also the allocation of the costs. The president read it out, uh, the president of the court read it out in Hungarian language, which is very cute for someone who actually speaks Hungarian. Um, now, the, um, uh, as to the merits, the legal basis for the regulation is solid. So the court, it respects the principle of conferral, does not interfere with Article 7 procedures and the process the conditionality regulation um, lays down is sufficiently clear. I think that was obvious for all lawyers uh, among us and, and for many of the institutions. It's only relevant because some institutions and especially the Council of Legal Service had an opposite uh, view on the matter. Also the Court of Justice dismissed the allegation by Hungary and Poland that the rule of law is not defined with sufficient clarity. Um, the court very much emphasized solidarity and mutual trust. Uh, which we might um, address later. Um, uh, and finally, uh, it underlined the link between the rule of law and the EU's financial interests. Now, this might be the weakest point of the judgment, if I may, um, because immediately it, it um, triggers the question whether the original version of the conditionality regulation as proposed by the commission, which where, where, where the document was still a truly rule of law protection instrument would have been ultra virus if this link was so necessary in, in the eyes of the court. Um, so what, what the court currently is saying is that the withholding of funds under the conditionality regulation cannot be used as a punishment for rule of law violations, but only as a means of keeping EU funds out of unsafe hands. That's all, uh, that's all they uh, dare to say uh, or that they are saying. Um, uh, so I wonder how, how important this link has to be for future possible rule of law. Um, instruments. Now, as to the importance of the judgment for uh, the future, and I already saw a question in the chat, so I would like to immediately respond uh, the quest, uh, to, the, uh, to the question by Marco Schwartz. Um, uh, the, uh, the real question is how, what, what, what would happen in the future, and I think that uh, the conditionality regulation should immediately be used. It should have been used, as I said, as of the 1st of January, 2021. But I think for many of us, it was rather disappointing to see Ozola von, von der Leyen saying um, that now, we, now that we know that the conditionality regulation is okay and the legal basis was okay, we will think about the guidelines. No, they should have thought about the guidelines before, but what is more, they shouldn't have thought about the guidelines because they should have uh, employed the document even irrespective of the guidelines. So they should immediately touch uh, the conditionality regulation and make use of it as, for example, such by, as suggested by professors uh, Mora and Schäppel and, uh, and, and Daniel Kahneman. Um, so the big question for the Hungarian um, um, opposition currently is, 
um, what they will do with the two third majority laws and especially the, um, the, the new constitution created by Fides, which can only be amended by a two third majority. And this is important because many aspects uh, that, um, that, that carve uh, the current uh, government's um, power structure in stone, uh, irrespective of the outcome of the next elections, uh, can only be amended by a two-third majority. Now, even if the current opposi opposition, united opposition wins the elections, they will most certainly not have a two-third uh, majority. So the question is how they can govern. Will the country become ungovernable under these legal structures? Uh, or um, if they need to touch the two-third majority laws, how will they do that by only having a simple majority? Now here, the broader question is whether you can build a rule of law, whether you can restore a state of the rule of law by violating to some extent the rule of law. And, and the question is whether, um, whether the EU institutions would interfere if the return, the avenue to return to the rule of law will not be 100% clean in terms of the rule of law. I think there are already some forward looking legal argumentations, for example, by the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights in an Icelandic case said that, well, for example, the, uh, one of the core issues, the irremovability of the judges. Of course, this is a core part of judicial integrity. But once we are talking about captured courts and captured judges who are only selected because of their loyalty to the government, their irremovability is not necessarily a value to be protected. So sometimes in a way, strictly speaking, you have to violate the rule of law in order to revert to the rule of law. So that's the big question for the future uh, that is still pending in the air and I have no bulletproof uh, answer. So um, I will just stop here and thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for this precise and concise analysis, both of the regulation and a bit of also of the judgments of the courts. I would, uh, I see that there are many, many questions. Also, one from our one of our panelists, Camino Mortera. So I would propose that we keep the questions uh, until the end, and I will give now the floor to Professor John Moray. Many thanks, uh, many thanks for for inviting me to this reconnect event. Reconnect, in my view, has truly brought together a remarkable group of experts uh, in this field over the last four years. I've always learned a lot from each of them, uh, and uh, I think uh, it's an example of EU money extremely well spent. And actually, the topic of today is how we make sure that all EU money is uh, well spent. And uh, I'm glad to be able to do that uh, uh, from Budapest. I'm actually in Budapest Airport, uh, especially for Petra, uh, who I admire greatly as a as an academic. So this session uh, is about the prospects of the, the scope of the conditionality regulation. And I want to touch upon two points and also uh, respectfully disagreeing to some extent with Petra because that's why we're here you know, in, in, in a panel. So the first has to do with uh, this worry that this instrument was drafted or interpreted by the court as to be too narrow uh, in scope. Uh, my argument will be that it's actually, uh, if you understand it properly in, uh, in its context, it's actually its focused scope that relates it specifically to the budget that it's uh, its main uh, strength, both uh, substantively and institutionally, and I'll explain that uh, in a second. The second point, uh, which we already touched upon a little bit earlier uh, in this uh, morning session, but is often ignored is, that the scope also links to the scope of the, the COVID funding and specifically also how the COVID funding is currently linked to rule of law elements. I'll discuss that and I think that with regard to some future uh, um, uh, developments and Camino already touched this morning uh, on, on the, the reality that since what happened yesterday uh, it's very likely that the dynamic uh, will change. I think it's very important to understand the scope and uh, the relation of the scope of the regulation we're discussing here and, and that of COVID funding. So let me start with the first issue. Was this instrument drafted uh, or interpreted too narrowly? Should we blame Daniel Freund for, for this uh, being a too narrow, uh, too narrow an instrument? Should it have been a rule of law instrument proper? Uh, these are often uh, heard arguments. And if you actually read the rulings, you may actually think that that is uh, the, uh, a correct analysis because the key word in these rulings, and it's absolutely remarkable if you often read uh, Court of Justice rulings, is that the word only, only is used a remarkable number of times. In the English version uh, of the Hungarian judgment, uh, it's uh, 
it's mentioned 76 times and in the, the Polish version, 73 times. And the ECJ endlessly underlines that given a legal basis, uh, which is to protect the budget, rule of law principles only play a role when their breach uh, impacts uh, the budget. At one point, the European Court of Justice even makes the point that uh, if a rule of law violation would continue, but there would no longer be an impact on the, on the budget, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the regulation should stop applying. So from that, you would indeed almost get a sense that this is an extremely limited, narrow uh, instrument that is of very little use, both to protecting uh, the, the budget and to protecting the rule of law. So my main argument here uh, for you today is that such an interpretation would be a major misunderstanding, both because it misreads the context, as well as the, as the specific, specificities of the, the content of the, the regulation. So I want to talk a little bit about that also uh, to try and address uh, uh, Petra's worry here. So first, the context. For, you need to understand that the, the set of financial uh, instruments that, were, that the regulation is just a part of is part of a much broader uh, set of instruments. There's Article 7, there's uh, or the infringement procedures, etc. that already have been uh, discussed uh, more broadly. My point is here really that you cannot project your disappointment with the Commission for underusing that on the regulation. Uh, you know, my claim has always been that the Commission has been uh, acting too little too late, and I still uh, think so to this day. Uh, they simply have to uh, bring many more 258 actions, uh, uh, but that cannot, uh, uh, pr cannot be projected on what, uh, the, the, the specific focus of this instrument. So that's my, my first element. The second element is that you also have to understand this regulation in, uh, in the specific context of what financial instruments can already do with regard to uh, the rule of law. Uh, so this comes on top, uh, this instrument, uh, on, of, of a number of other uh, budgetary instruments like the Common Provisions Regulation, the Financial Regulation. These all have already um, rule of law aspects to that and, and human rights aspect to that. Uh, for example, it's possible uh, that uh, you suspend uh, funding for human rights related reasons, uh, for example, uh, LGBTI free zones uh, in, in, in Poland, that's already uh, possible. Uh, the regulation does not change anything about that. And here again, the, the argument is really, the commission should simply do that more often. And also uh, importantly, and I know that Daniel Freud makes a big point of this as well, more transparently, uh, the commission should actually explain better when it does so in a transparent way. So after these two steps, we can understand what is the specific added value of the, the, the conditionality regulation. And Peter already touched on that. It's because that is comprehensive and proactive. So comprehensive in the sense that it applies if other financial instruments would have less impact. And it can also be applied proactively. So only if there's a risk and that something will go wrong, you can already trigger it rather than only ex post factor. Now, uh, you know, also given the circumstances, I want to uh, give some good news or at least an interpretation that I think uh, is worthy of our consideration. I think that by, by, by actually having sent these letters to Hungary and Poland, as uh, Daniel actually mentioned, the Commission has already crossed the Rubicon of acknowledging that the situation in Poland and Hungary is so uh, significant and, and different from uh, other situations that it has already triggered and concluded that the conditionality regulation needs to be triggered. So a more comprehensive approach is uh, required than uh, is already available on our other in, uh, financial instruments. I think that this uh, is worth underlining uh, in and of itself. Um, uh, and, and, and it's actually already a victory that Daniel can put on his uh, CV. So my second point is about the content. Uh, it's often said, you know, why is this so ridiculously narrow? Why only a subset uh, of, of uh, rule of law uh, uh, elements? Uh, I think that we have to understand uh, that it's highly significant that these three rule of law elements have actually been specifically selected for because they have the biggest impact on, uh, on protecting the EU budget. They are anti-corruption, independent prosecution and independent judiciary. And the key insight here uh, is that these are all systemic issues. Uh, why is that? It's very hard to see how each of these uh, can happen in an isolated or incidental way. And therefore that their actual or potential impacts on the budget would be coincidental. Simply to, to uh, drive this point home, it's logically simply hard to think of a situation where corruption only happens with national and not EU money. It's 
particular situation where uh, prosecution is uh, uh, properly uh, only undertaken with regard to a national situation and not uh, an EU situation and the same for, for judicial independence. So this is the reason why I'm not that worried uh, that uh, even the wording of that there needs to be a genuine link uh, with, with the budget uh, is, is limiting in any way. It's simply a matter of uh, political leadership by the by commission to draw the same conclusion that I'm just drawing here, that in fact, these three rule of law elements have been selected for a reason, namely that they are systemic. And because they're systemic, they will uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, impact on, on anything relating to the, to the budget. And as I said, the commission has already shown signs that it sees this uh, at the value of the regulation over other instruments. So I think that that is worth underlining. Now, the last point, uh, Chair, uh, with regard to my first point and the second point, we will much uh, briefer. Uh, what is also extremely consequential uh, about this specific legal basis is that it not, not only has a substantive impact, but also an institutional impact. Why is that? Uh, the budget is dealt with, with uh, dealt with by DG budget people, not DG justice people. This is basically the equivalent of a problem being dealt with uh, by hard-nosed and quiet accountants and auditors and not by angry and loud human rights NGOs. And we all know uh, who gets usually farther in, the, in this world. So let me tell you also from my experience in working in, inside of the EU, I, in my view, this is good because it means that the ECJ has green-lighted that the rule of law has been added to the EU's uncontroversial core DNA. Uh, but it means too that we as rule of law uh, people need to translate and transliterate our rule of law concerns into the vocabulary of, of the budget people and explain to them why the rule of law uh, problems affect the sound financial management. Now, the second uh, point that I want to make, and this will be very much briefer, uh, it has to do with the overlapping scope of the EU recovery funds and this regulation. Uh, the, the regulation clearly, uh, the, the conditionality regulation clearly says in recital uh, seven that it covers both traditional MFM funding and uh, COVID funding. And in regulation 2021-141, which established a recovery and resilience facility, it is stated in article eight that the commission needs to implement COVID funding in accordance with the, uh, the, the, the conditionality regulation. So in the sense, there's a bit of an overlap between the proactive element of the COVID instrument itself and the proactive element of the, uh, of the specific uh, uh, COVID uh, regulation. Uh, and the reason why this will become extremely relevant, I think, is that since uh, what happened yesterday, it's, I think, increasingly likely that uh, the Commission will soon uh, green light funding towards opponent anyway, even if uh, the proposals that are currently on the, on the table will not really uh, uh, solve the judicial independence problems that Daniel uh, already uh, mentioned earlier. But the key insight here is that even if it starts being greenlighted under COVID, the rule of law conditionality regulation will still remain uh, applicable even to that situation. So if uh, what will happen, uh, what we can already see happening is, uh, is that uh, the judicial independence problem uh, will still uh, remain in place in Poland. The, the, the general conditionality uh, regulation can also be applied to COVID funding still, even after it's greenlighted under the COVID instrument proper. So I think that the, the main lesson, and this is really my last point, is that we have to uh, look at the ball and not at, uh, uh, at uh, the, the trickery. Uh, uh, I'm a football fan. When all is said and done, the experience with withholding COVID funding, in my view, also shows that pressure works. Uh, because uh, Poland, after all, is coming up uh, with uh, proposals, even if they're uh, not proper proposals. So... Some member states may not acknowledge the legal and principled resonance of rule of law norms and, and smokescreen constantly about them, but all of them definitely acknowledge the political significance of access to cash and the threat to their own political viability if they cannot secure that. Uh, I think that's yet another reason to be optimistic about the impact of the rule of law and condition, uh, conditionality regulation, especially here in beautiful Budapest. So thanks very much. Thank you very, very much uh, also for your analysis, but also for the dialogue with what said, was said before by uh, Petra Bard and also Daniel Freund. Uh, what I would propose, I see that Daniel Freund would like to react, uh, I suppose, to what has been said before. So we will hear his reaction and then we will collect a number of questions and we will continue the discussion. 
Yes, just just very briefly, I, I wanted to to react to something that Petra said. Um, you know, repairing the rule of law by breaking the rule of law. I, I think for, for me, it needs to be seen a bit the other way around. The rule of law isn't there to protect rule of law violations, you know. Um, so you, you alluded to that with the with the Iceland ruling as well. And I think that's that that's really the, the, the line of argument that, that needs to be made, you know, if illegally the, um, there, there have been judicial appointments, if uh, there is illegal modifications of a constitution, uh, then rectifying those illegal acts is, is not breaking the rule of law, it is reestablishing or, or preserving the, the rule of law. <coughs> Sorry, the, the second point, just very briefly on you know, to come back to that Hungary situation and whether you trigger before or after the elections. I think, you know, if you only look at before the elections and then, you know, argue, as, as I said, that uh, this is somehow interference, you know, look at what then happens if you trigger after the election. Um, if, if Orban wins, which unfortunately seems the slightly more, more likely scenario at the moment, and the commission triggers shortly after the election, fully admitting that they had full knowledge of, of everything that was going on. And they just wanted to confirm that he is reelected before actually uh, go, going public. I think that is a huge political risk for, for the European Commission. So I would advise them to, to go first. The other scenario is, of course, that, that I'm hoping for, that the opposition uh, manages to win. And then the commission comes out and as the first uh, sort of welcome gift uh, to, to the opposition triggers the mechanism, because obviously on election night, nothing changes. You know, the, the, uh, the non-independence of the judiciary remains after the election. Uh, the broken procurement system remains. The non-functioning anti-corruption bodies remain. So nothing changes. So the commission is still under legal obligation to trigger and then sends, uh, you know, a little gift to, to, to Orban, who has just been, uh, you know, thrown out of office to then argue, look, that is what you get when you elect the opposition. Uh, you, you get the commission to trigger uh, the rule of law conditionality. But regardless of all that, I think uh, the, the opposition will actually welcome uh, the, the the triggering of of the mechanism, even if it ha happens under the new mandate, they need that pressure, because otherwise there's just simply no way to do the necessary reforms if it is not fully, uh, you know, condoned and and supported by 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 the European Union. They they are unlikely to have the two thirds majority. So actually, classify the the European Commission classifying this as a systemic systemic. A breaking of rule of law principles helps that argument of we need to, you know, not have the current rule of law uh, protect rule of law violations. That's why it's so essential uh, as well, not only to protect the, the, the budget and, and all our taxpayer money, uh, but, but to, um, to be able to, to put the, the necessary reforms uh, on, on, on track, regardless of, of who's in power. Thank you very much for this reaction to Petra Bart's presentation, but also for addressing one of the questions that we have in the chat box from Marco Schwartz. Uh, I propose now, I see Petra, I suppose Petra, you would like to react to uh, Daniel's friend reaction, and then I will give the floor to Camino Mortera. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I very much agree with you on, on, on this. So what are we protecting in the end of the day? Are we protecting an illiberal regime allegedly with rule of law measures? Uh, they, that wouldn't make sense, obviously, but this also triggers a very uncomfortable question that I just would uh, like to raise as a follow-up uh, problem uh, to the one uh, we have jointly presented, if I may, um, which is that uh, rule of law benchmarks, they do not work for hybrid regimes. And, and this is very clear also in, with regard to, the, um, to, to monitoring, not just with regard to enforcement. So when it comes to the annual rule of law report by the commission, um, there, the question is whether all these benchmarks that the commission lays down are applicable to illiberal regimes that are, cannot, or are not labeled as democracies or Hungary is not even labeled as a free country anymore uh, by think, uh, think tanks um, and, and organizations assessing um, countries from the rule of law perspective. 
Um, just to give you an example, um, digitalization of judgment is not really a virtue if these judgments are laid down by kangaroo courts. It doesn't really tell us anything about the value of these judgments if they are digitalized. Or, 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 or uh, similarly, if the judgments are rendered during a very fast process, again, that's not a virtue if the judges uh, belong to a captured court and they are fully, independent, uh, fully dependent uh, on the executive power. Um, or, for example, the Media Council, which is perfectly financed in Hungary, is it really a virtue to per perfectly finance um, the institutions that are taking care of government propaganda? So all these, um, all these benchmarks simply do not work well. And I know this is uncomfortable because the EU institutions, especially the Commission, always places an emphasis on the fact that uh, there is an equal treatment of the member states. Even though I think this is a somewhat uh, this is a, um, a, a somewhat unconvincing argument, especially given the fact that, for example, the rule of law framework was not triggered against Hungary but was against Poland, so it's not always treating the member states uh, on an equal basis. But at least this is what it's preaching. However, I think that the uh, that the Commission and all institutions, for that matter, should acknowledge that similar cases need to be treated similarly, but these similar cases need to be treated differently. And hybrid regimes clearly need different benchmarks uh, and, and, and not necessarily the traditional rule of law benchmarks that are applicable to constitutional democracy because these won't work there. In the end, we will only protect the hybrid regime itself and will prevent a possible return to the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Camilo Mosteros, please. Um, yeah, thanks yeah. so much. Yeah, sorry, I was um, I was in mute. Actually, um, I had a um, couple of questions and now I also have comments, which is um, great because that's what you do in panels. Um, Petra, you cannot be more right about um, this comparison of benchmarks. And I actually think this goes beyond the question of illiberal regimes. I um, remember when I was very young um, working on the justice scoreboards, um, as a consultant, it was a nightmare uh, because A, uh, member states did not want to provide us with data and B, we were comparing data which were not comparable. And yet the commission insisted over and over again um, to use that scoreboard to sort of like, you know, decide which countries were doing okay and which countries weren't. So I always said that this kind of system is just comparing uh, apples and pears. Um, so just to underline that. Um, but no, my question, um, so I have um, two questions both related to what happened yesterday and what's happening today. So um, as I said before, and I think John and Petra uh, both agree with that, I think um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, will change a lot of things, not least um, questions about uh, the rule of law, and even migration and things like that in the countries that we are talking about. Um, so I have one question and one disagreement. The question is for Petra. Um, Petra, what do you think, how, how do you think the Putin's actions are going to impact the Hungarian election? Because I can see in a scenario where um, sort of people, the people in Hungary realize that being an autocrat is not that nice. Um, and maybe rally around the opposition in a way that we did not think could be possible before, or maybe I'm completely wrong. So that's why I'm asking you. And then John, you said that there is a scenario um, where because of uh, the, the Russian invasion, we'll see uh, the commission greenlighting the recovery fund for Poland very quickly. And then we'll have a problem um, with, the, with the judiciary because we wouldn't have resolved the question of the judiciary there. I see a different scenario, which is that the commission indeed could um, approve some funding, and I, and I think it's going to announce it very soon, uh, to deal with things like migration and things like that, uh, and some funding as well to sort of offset uh, the impact of sanctions uh, for those uh, most affected by them, including Poland, uh, doesn't necessarily need to be the recovery fund, but even if it's the recovery fund, I think the most important element here is that yesterday the, um, the commission announced that they were suspending fiscal rules indefinitely, which may open the door to have a recovery fund or something similar to the recovery fund extending beyond 2023, 
with the benchmarks and with the sort of the, the, the whole controls that they're attached to it, so that we may see a, a strengthening control of rule of law when if we talk about rule of law like legal sovereignty and all these sort of things, um, as opposed to triggering the conditionality mechanism. So that's sort of an optimistic scenario um, when I'm starting to think about like how um, the Russian, the Russia, Ukraine. I'm sorry, uh, I don't want to be impolite, but we yeah, have only no. three minutes. It is a very long comment. Absolutely. With many, many questions. I would like yes, to sorry. use my also my uh, um, to, to take one minute to ask maybe two questions very, very quickly. One is about uh, something which was emphasized both by John Moraine and also Petra Bartz about this fact that there is the link and it was overemphasized, the fact that the regulation is about the protection of the EU budget, it's not about rule of law. My first question is that I have the feeling that the text of the regulation has been written with this in mind, that this is a regulation to protect the EU uh, budget, is not a regulation about the rule of law. So this is one question that I would like to maybe ask to Daniel Freund, perhaps from this opinion of the legal service of the council, this was maybe a factor uh, triggering or shaping to some extent the content of the regulation to see it very clearly linked to, uh, to the protection of the EU budget. To Daniel Freund, maybe also because you were involved in the negotiations and I know that it was hard for the parliament to uh, reach a consensus on that, what is your regret, considering that the regulation is not perfect, given the many uh, concessions which were uh, uh, done uh, during the process? And last question, I would be, this is a bit of speculation, but do you think that the Commission, if the regulation is triggered, so do you think that the Commission will be able to have a majority in the Council to adopt it? So I will stop here, we have three minutes. So maybe I would give the floor in the same order. Uh, Daniel uh, Freund, then Petra Bart, and then John Moren. So th this regulation is about two things. So to be triggered, you need a rule of law violation and an impact on the budget or a risk of an impact on the budget. If there is only risk for the budget, it's not for this regulation. If it's only rule of law, it's not for this regulation. You need both. Both conditions need to be fulfilled. So it's not about either or, it's about the combination of the two. Otherwise, there wasn't a legal base. That, that's the reason why, why it was done like that. You can regret. I also would like something to deal with media independence, with you know minority rights, but there is currently no legal base to do something on, on, on those without the, the budget impact. The negotiations, yes, were hard. It felt like Orban was basically constantly in the room and the, the German ambassador told me time and again that they were having daily exchanges with the Hungarian government. And I think that the German presidency that we negotiated that with was giving way too much weight to the concerns of Poland and Hungary, which they wanted to bring on board and they couldn't in the end. They voted against this anyways, but they made the text weaker. The, the, the biggest, I mean, regret in that sense, but it was simply not possible to do with the government is to have the, you know, reverse qualified majority in, in the thing. It changes, not only that it makes it, you know, a different, more difficult to achieve majority, but it changes the whole dynamic of the thing. And we see now with the recovery fund versus the use of the conditionality mechanism that, you know, it changes everything. If, if the default scenario is you do nothing and thereby punish Poland and Hungary because they don't get their recovery funds, that happens. But if you need to actively do something to cut their funding, that doesn't happen. So that's the whole logic that unfortunately we were not able to win uh, against uh, the government. Final thing, uh, if there is a trigger, is there a majority? I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic. The thing that I have a bigger fear about is that the commission might actually trigger, but then impose a ridiculously small financial sanction. You know, we see the 1 million and a half a day for Poland now doesn't do it. Well, it there is discussion, there's proposals, yes, but it, it hasn't changed the actual situation yet. So if they trigger the mechanism and then say, well, now we freeze a 10 million euro a year budget line or something, well, then it will simply not do anything. And I actually, that, that would be an interesting question that maybe John Moraine can answer to me at some point. I don't even know how it works if you impose a sanction, realize it's not enough, 
and then come back and want to impose more? Have you to go back to step one and, and enter into that dialogue with the government? Or can you simply at that point just propose, well, now we're cutting this extra budget line to the council and put it to a vote. Basically, how long does it take to, to up the, the sanctions game after? Is it nine months each time or is it a, a, a shorter time period? Thanks. Thank you very much, Petra. Thank you very much. Just clearly, just two, two brief issues. The one is the link. Um, I, I, I'm wondering, and, and John knows this, what preoccupies me the most is, is how this um, uh, strong emphasis on the link uh, can be reconciled with other findings of the court, namely mutual trust and solidarity, which the court equally emphasizes. So if mutual trust and solidarity are so important uh, when we are protecting money, uh, then it should be equally important or even more important when we are protecting fundamental rights and individual rights. So I'm wondering whether the case law of the Court of Justice in criminal law related cases and asylum uh, related cases uh, would be impacted by the judgment and whether uh, the court would play, uh, pay uh, or put a, a similarly a huge emphasis on, on mutual trust and solidarity. I'm actually waiting for the court to do that. And as to as to Kamina's question, yes, I, 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 this is this is a mystery to me. But the but the government has a sovereignist politics and still has a very strong strategic agreements uh, uh, cutting back its solidarity when it comes to Russia or China, for example. It says that it's very much against international and multinational companies. Nevertheless, it concludes so-called strategic and by the way, secret agreements with, uh, with multinational companies and it doesn't hurt the government. It has a very anti-Semitic Soros campaign and is best friends with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Israeli politicians. It doesn't hurt it. Uh, it defines itself as illiberal and uses uh, the language of, 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 of liberal democracy. Or it says that it's conservative and it just you know, doesn't even respect the Ten Commandments, especially the seventh and the eighth, if I may say. So it somehow doesn't really hurt um, um, the government. And I think the main reason is um, media capture. So they present a whole different picture of what is actually happening, just coming to the conditionality regulation. Uh, the judgment when it came out, the justice minister gave a speech saying that this judgment is about LGBT propaganda in our schools. It, it, you know, it's totally unrelated, but this is the message and this is, this is the media content that people consume. Therefore, I don't think that any of these that you have listed would harm the government. They are just painting an alternative universe via their media outlets. And I think this was also the first reaction of the Minister of Justice after the publication of the rulings of the Court of Justice. Uh, John Moraine, maybe one or two minutes uh, to react to what Absolutely. you said. Absolutely, yeah, Thank sure. Uh, so uh, to, to react to Comino's point, uh, my point was really about the overlap between the general uh, conditionality regulation and the COVID uh, uh, conditionality. I mean, there's a reason why uh, Hungary and Poland at the time did not uh, uh, make any fuss about uh, the COVID conditionality because nobody actually saw the rule of law element there. So in fact, the situation and the leverage that we're now in uh, is sort of uh, coincidental. Uh, in my view, but it has now a flip side, and that also links to, to Ramona's question about possibility of uh, QMV. Some member states that have no rule of law problem at all, but they have other uh, recommendations uh, under the European semester, are really not that happy with the Commission putting its foot down uh, uh, for COVID conditionality. Uh, um, and, and that may influence whether they actually give their vote in the QMV under, for any sanction or any uh, measure uh, taken under the, the general uh, uh, the, the rule of law conditionality mechanism. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried that I'm a little less optimistic than Daniel here that this, this would be so easy to to gather, simply because for, for, for other member states, this will not really be a rule of law or a budget protection uh, problem, but it will be about how assertive do we want the commission to be to uh, apply uh, uh, across all member states, uh, any sort of uh, conditionality. Um, I think that the point that, uh, that Petra made, that there's this inherent tension between what the court uh, says uh, in, in the judgment, uh, mentioning only uh, 76 times uh, 
insisting on a sufficient link, but also using very grand words about solidarity, uh, etc., is a uh, is a is a very uh, valid uh, observation. That's the reason why I am optimistic that they're just uh, they, they just wanted to get this through, and they know one hundred percent that uh, if eventually uh, we have a huge uh, measure proposed uh, to uh, to Hungary opponent, they will have to decide uh, on that again because it will be one hundred percent sure that Poland and Hungary will go back to court, and then they will perhaps clarify, be able to clarify what is sufficient link and what is proportional. So uh, I think that they have really sort of parked this thing and they know that they will have to decide about this in, in, on the later stage. As to Daniel's, and that's will really be my last point on our Daniel's question, uh, could the commission propose something ridiculously low uh, and then halfway think, uh, in fact, it should have been uh, higher uh, and then do that sort of uh, in the course of the same procedure? I don't think so. You probably have to start from uh, step one again. So this militates in favor, if you would ask my advice. Uh, for 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 you guys at the European Parliament to insist that the European Commission should actually aim very high and expect this to be negotiated down in the Council rather than agree with the Commission uh, when it proposes something 35 or 25 percent because that that will be uh, uh, very difficult to remedy because you would have to go back uh, to step one and uh, spend another nine months. So thanks a lot for for the invitation. It was a, an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. I'm afraid our time is up uh, and it is a pity because we still have many, many questions, but I suppose Reconnect will organize many other events to go into details and to discuss all of this. So stay tuned and follow the activities of the project. Thank you very, very much for this um, uh, interesting and rich dialogue. It was a pleasure to chair this panel because there is a real dialogue between the panelists. It was a real dialogue and also a bit of disagreement. So this uh, made the panel really uh, interesting and fascinating. Uh, we will have also events uh, here at the Institute for European Studies, a discussion about uh, the rulings of the Court of Justice soon. Uh, I suppose Reconnect will plan also other activities. So. Uh, Thank you very much for the participation of this panel, and I hope to see you in other conversations and other uh, panels uh, in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.